All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of O365A. In this episode, we're going to be talking about, um, you know, notes from the field over the last, uh, I think, uh, four to six weeks now that, uh, you know, COVID uh, has been in full swing and everybody's been working from home. And we wanted to sort of do a little bit of a roundtable on, you know, um, what we are seeing um, from a field perspective and how the customers are migrating and adopting um, Microsoft Teams. Uh, as you noticed here, we got our lovely uh, backgrounds. So that rolled out, uh, <clears throat> I think, last week. And I think there's going to be a few more updates co hopefully coming soon. So I uh, wanted to show off our new, uh, our new backgrounds here. So I'm going to pass it off to Dino to uh, lead us off. Great. Thanks, Ab. So uh, I'm seeing a couple of scenarios uh, with my customers. Um, to start off, um, there's customers that are currently using Skype for Business uh, on-prem, and they're experiencing capacity-related issues uh, just simply because of the fact that they've got more people working from home, and um, they're starting to see things like call drops and bad audio quality in meetings. So I wrote an article, LinkedIn article, which we're going to post to the uh, podcast notes that will show you how you can quickly see if you're experiencing capacity issues in your environment. So have a look for that uh, when we post this and on the on our, our podcast site. So to address like these capacity related issues, um, some orgs are attempting to add more capacity to their uh, environment, like i.e. scaling out more servers horizontally. But truthfully, the, the better approach is to really begin hosting meetings on Teams. So, um, you know, to move, to move some of these meetings off of the Skype for Business servers and onto Teams. So with one of these customers, we saw that they were hosting, there were many meetings of 250 people are close to that mark as possible. And that's the theoretical limitation of, in Skype for Business. So um, obviously if we shift those meetings to Teams, then you're removing that workload off, off your server. So you're freeing up some uh, capacity on those servers. Now you're gonna say, well, Teams has the same 250 user limitation, but the thing is the Teams service was built to scale to handle like, a lot of these uh, meetings and, and concurrency in your own tenants. So obviously Microsoft's designed the product to handle um, much more than just 250 people in a single on a single server. So this is why adding more servers isn't a great long-term approach. It would just be a, a short-term fix. Um, so if you're if you're thinking about doing this, you know you could certainly deploy a standard edition server, um, which you could easily move a user to to host 250 user meeting, for example, and that should guarantee you some some better quality than just taking your chances on the existing polls you have. So again, only a short-term fix. Um, secondly, I'm seeing um, there was organizations that were in the middle of uh, their co their planning uh, to move to Teams and when COVID hit. And um, so these these were orgs that were already in, you know, down the path of doing some of their planning and then had to kind of pivot a bit. So what they're typically doing is um, they're first they want to they're trying to move users that uh, to teams first and foremost and then dealing with the other critical issues like um, um, you know meeting rooms and phones which aren't obviously critical right now because no one's in the office using these devices so dealing with the critical issues of moving users and then addressing the other things later I had uh, one customer that was in islands mode uh, for quite a long period of time. So they had roughly half the, their customer base, uh, half their custom, uh, customers using Teams and the other half still using Skype for business. Um, I say customers, I should say users. And what happened was, you know, obviously if you try to use the interop modes, you're gonna have to take away functionality from some of those users. So that's not a good approach. So what they've done is just set a hard deadline, you know, two weeks from today, for example, to say, look, everybody that's on, uh, that's using Skype for business, you should convert your meetings to Teams and start IMing people on, on Teams as well. And so then in that two week period, they're gonna work on moving response groups, for example, that the company's using and then do a massive migration over a weekend to get everybody actually on the Teams only mode. So these are the, these are the things that I'm seeing um, I think that they're they're good approaches. I like the way customers are kind of thinking out of the box and and uh, you know certainly uh, making making strides to 
um, alleviate some of the pressures, short-term pressures they're seeing and getting onto teams that, you know, is helping them um, solve those problems. So Hab, maybe tell us what uh, you've been seeing. Yeah, so I think uh, sort of in addition to what you were mentioning as well, you know, there are some customers that I've, I've been working with that um, are currently on prem still, but they're lighting up new features inside there, like the dial-in conferencing capabilities and stuff like that, because everybody is home and not everybody has like a really good connection. So they want to be able to provide that additional functionality. Um, and in, in other cases too, I've seen a lot of uptake on the, remote services like with teams. So like utilizing like Citrix desktop services, um, you know, providing like a full desktop solution and deploying teams within that and being able to utilize, you know, your, <clears throat> your uh, devices that you have, uh, you know, on your, on your home computer, like a camera and audio devices and stuff like that. Another one as well is the Windows virtual desktop has been another one that I have been seeing and working with some clients on and deploying that um, so that, you know, in the event that the user doesn't have like a high performing uh, workstation at home um, and they don't have any type of remote access capabilities to give them the tools that they need. So they're giving them like a Windows virtual uh, desktop in Azure, which comes with like a full fledged Windows 10 desktop, all the desktop clients. There's a remote connection uh, back into the home, back into the office, so they can still get to all the internal infrastructure and stuff like that, and utilize Teams for like the meetings and the callings and chat experiences and stuff like that. And then one thing that uh, I have seen as well during some of the migrations I've been doing is obviously there is a um, uh, I've been scaled down on the services on the services side. So. Uh, from a throttling perspective that we talked about the last time. And then <clears throat> I came across this uh, team status page um, that I wrote a little article about, and I'll, I'll put that in this blog here, but basically it it tells you, um, you know, what what state your user in is when the um, when they're enabled for teams. So whether what their status is, if they're in processing or if they're completed, and that way you don't have to keep trying to see if the user has been completed or not. It's a nice place to a single location to go and, and see. So um, that's all uh, sort of what I've been seeing in the field and uh, I'll pass it over to Michael. Yeah, thanks, Heb. Most of the customers I've been working with for the last few weeks is, uh, you know, in the governance, uh, government space, education, and energy. And uh, there's still this race uh, to get corporate compliance tools out before kind of the consumer ones take a foothold. You know, some of the other products out there that are, you know, just swipe a credit card and start using. So there's this kind of battle of, you know, how much governance and how many policies to uh kind of control the the service that you're going to roll out while you know these other workloads are are being used today uh the big one is you know vpn split tunneling so Hab was mentioning citrix and the use of you know still connecting back into those on-premises uh, data repositories so you know your 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 vpns are getting uh quite a bit of load happening right now you know having to relicense it and resize it but the first thing is really dealing with, you know, separate out the, the team's media traffic and not have that going over that, that same connection. That will help relieve the, the load on those VPNs, but also improve the media experience. So I've been spending a lot of time doing network assessments and working with network teams on testing and verifying that, you know, the traffic is going through split tunneling. Uh, Microsoft released an update to their proof of concept network tool, the connectivity.office.com. And that tool will actually test tell you now if you're going through a VPN or if you're being split tunneled. So great update. Uh, the only thing with that is it now does it needs .NET Core to be installed to run the little applet. So you have to install that before you can install the applet. And then I'm seeing a lot a transition. So uh, working with a few partners and they've been selling Teams projects around like doing workshops. And so I'm seeing like this transition where customers are having to move much faster. So they, they want less planning sessions and more doing sessions. So instead of doing workshops, they're doing working sessions. So instead of talking about where what what are all the policies and what are all the options, they want to see the policies and then the best recommendations of what they should set at this time. And then they'll come back uh, and reevaluate in the future. But they want to have a kind of a standard governance posture just to get the tools out. 
I'm also seeing uh, training users at mass. So a lot of large, you know, live events or online meetings used to train end users and many working uh, sessions back to back uh, as customers are going from small pilots to full enterprise rollout of teams for, for online meetings. And I'm seeing uh, Kurt and I did a session around, uh, you know, building apps within Teams. And uh, you can still register and watch it. It's at aka.ms uh, slash DVC. But we're seeing a lot of organizations take the getting started app and, and modifying that and putting their, their intranet site into Teams as well as all the training content that they've been creating. So these recording these uh, training sessions, FAQs, you know, Microsoft Learning Pathways. And connecting that all in as a you know a way to drive adoption as they're doing these mass rollouts. I'm also starting to see a, a new wave of requests. Uh, so as customers kind of tackle the internal communication, uh, you know, using Skype for or sorry for Teams for online meetings, voice and video, and, and live events, they're starting to now start talking about uh, moving their PBX and getting enterprise voice into teams and now enabling that external outside of the business kind of normal operations side. And we're seeing that, uh, you know, that's sorry, that's the next wave of conversations. I also have some customers where we got out of islands mode, uh, got into something like, you know, Skype for business with cloud because they have Skype for business uh, server. And now business is pushing them to maybe turn on islands mode for some users because they're not ready to move enterprise voice into Teams, but they want to book Teams meetings because of the experience and the, uh, you know, the uh, the improved media stack. And so it's a uh, it's interesting to see like all this effort to get them into a mode that helps them kind of stage their move. And now it's like no, we we just need Teams now, but we'll, we'll worry about the other stuff uh, later. Uh, it's interesting uh change in, in pace and then some of the stuff i've kind of been building uh to kind of support myself through all this is i've been using a lot of power automate uh so i've been using power automate to sync all my calendars and customer cal uh, accounts and vendor accounts into a shared calendar that i can release to project managers it was surprising how much effort it takes to to deal with uh, calendar syncing between uh, or event syncing between all calendars, dealing with reoccurring events, cancellations, status changes, and and all that. But uh, hopefully one day I'll blog about it. Uh, and then the other one is I've been using a lot of forms to do surveys for end users and to do uh, prepping of uh, sessions for working sessions and, and uh, workshops. And I've been using forms and Power Automate to pull those responses into Planner and then assign them to people to review. So then we have like kind of a ticketing system around it. Uh, but it's been uh, pretty helpful uh, to kind of deal with all the responses. Kurt, how, how, what have you been seeing? Yeah, thanks, Michael. So uh, I have a little bit of a different uh, view on the world because uh, I work for a, a partner, Quest Software. And so um, it's been interesting seeing the the conversations and the demand for some of our products increase. Um, we have one particular product called On Demand License Management, and it gives um, gathers all the licensing information that's assigned to all the users in your organization, um, every product, every add-on, and actually has usage information associated with it. And we're getting a lot more questions, a lot more interest around that product. I think what's driving that is a couple things. As you know, COVID is force this work from home scenario and more people need different types of services in Office 365 to work. I think uh, some organizations are struggling a bit with what license they need for what what feature. And so um, that product uh, allows them to get that visibility. And also just uh, staff turnover too, um, just managing all the licensing in, in that scenario. Um, uh, you know, you want to reclaim licenses that aren't being used. And, um, you know, Habib mentioned audio conferencing, for example. Um, you know, for that to light up, you need the phone system license and audio conference li licensing. So uh, it allows uh, organizations to drill into that and just manage that easier and better as uh, the COVID situation unfolds. Um, so there's that. I've also seen um, some organizations that were in the middle of planning their move to uh, to the cloud when COVID hit and they hadn't done the identity synchronization yet uh, up in Office 365, which of course is a big problem because 
Office 365 is really dependent on that Azure AD identity. So we've seen some customers actually just uh, spin up a, a brand new tenant uh, to get Teams. Um, uh, so they could just literally host meetings and, and get people lit up with Teams, which is a solution, but uh, not a not a good long term one because um, having two I, two identities for each user is never never a good long term um, thing. But nevertheless, it allowed them to, uh, to to meet the need in the short term. And also, um, we've seen some some customers now that you know Teams is being used more um, just to. You know they deployed it more rapidly than they they wanted so now they're getting a little more focused on okay did we deploy it correctly is there any big security holes we missed in terms of you know basic stuff like having mfa on the identity and what does that guest access look like in teams who from the outside outside of my company can get at the data in teams so we're just seeing uh, more questions and interest around um, uh, governance and compliance now that teams is out there and, and people are actually using it so that's, uh, that's about it from my end. Uh, Habib, I'll uh, send it back to you and uh, wrap it up. Yeah, so uh, no, I mean, it's definitely a lot of really different use cases. And, and I think it's the, the big takeaway is like, it's like rapid deployment, you know, partners and, and customers that have been sort of delaying the, the migration to teams or the upgrade to teams, um, you know, from a future perspective that just, you know, really just came up and it's like, okay, we need it now because they, they get, they see the value of the, the way you can communicate with and collaborate within teams. Um, and having that additional, uh, you know, functionality is, I think is a benefit to them as well. So it, there's definitely I've seen that um, you know as a big as a big uptake, but yeah, definitely a lot of use cases, a lot of different things that we're seeing in the field, and uh, hopefully um, everybody enjoyed the uh, the session, and hopefully we'll catch you on our next episode. Thanks, great, thanks Thank everybody. You.